All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night here from Tokyo, Japan. And oh, answer. we are here from undisclosed location. <laughs> uh, here we go. I, I would say you're over at Davos, right? Ha 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 ha. No, I wish. That'd be nice. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. So um, yeah, I think some people from our audience may know you already from the uh, Cultivate Crypto Elgo service, right? But there's probably quite a few people who don't. So um, yeah, uh, I'll introduce you here in a second. But just to mention uh, what episode we're on and everything, we are in episode 448. We're going to be talking about running defense and offense uh, in crypto with Tyler Irvin here. So um, yeah, I don't know how many people in our audience uh, have been in contact with you maybe through the telegram chats because you've been in the course for quite a while now right yeah um i mean i believe i've taken four courses already so i'm just like man i got that that diploma i feel like you know but at, at the same time <laughs> it's just like you know crypto is so expansive you're continuing to educate yourself and uh see the the broader markets as well and so it's just very interesting you know yeah and i've been we've been having a lot of conversations i've been really interested in bringing you on to the YouTube um, for a while now, uh, Mike as well, right from uh, TA on chain, and I guess um, for Tyler, we're going with Swerve the Dip. Yeah, right. yeah, no, like that's it's very interesting. So, like for a very long time, um, and I'll probably share a little bit more about my background as we yeah. go on. But you know, people have been calling me Swerve for a very long time since I was you know young, since I was like maybe like 18, 19 years old, because of my my play style, you know, when I was playing ball and stuff like that. So. Yeah. You were uh, in the NFL. You were both a running back and wide receiver, but uh, running back was your main position. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Running back was probably like my main position, but also uh, where I made a lot of my hay was in the special teams game. So as a returner, okay. so kick return, punt return. I was that guy basically yeah. catching the the missiles, kind of flying out the air and making everybody miss. So <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting Talking one about high risk. <laughs> yeah, I, I was watching. I forget what I was watching exactly, but I was watching some you know, different shows on NFL stuff, you know, and they're like, it takes a special kind of person to be willing to stand there with like what, like, you know, 20 different guys coming at you ready to like yeah. take your head off, basically. Yeah, yeah. No, talk about high risk. Right. And so it's funny how <laughs> kind of gravitate towards crypto, which. You know, but uh, like I see it in the same way. It's just kind of, hey, you know how to maneuver within what you're doing. Uh, you can find a lot of success. And so, you know, I see right. the same thing, uh, you know, in crypto, had a lot of that success. And then so also, you know, just encouraging you guys, man, wag me. You know, we're all going to make it. Just got to stand the game, you know? Yeah. And there was some people in the chat wondering, like, Charlie, why do you got a Green Bay Packer coming on the show? <laughs> <laughs> I I would have never yeah. in my wildest dreams expected that the first NFL player that we have on our show uh, is a Green Bay Packer. But hey. You know, I respect the hell out of the Packers. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, um, I mean, damn good player. Uh, Favre, you know, I Favre was a great player for years. Came over to the Vikings as well. Um, you know, good stuff there. So, uh, you know, solid interdivision stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like, because, like, you know, when I first met you and we started talking a little bit, I was like, oh, don't tell me you're a Vikings <laughs> fan. You got to be kidding me. But uh yeah i mean in, in respect to uh the packers great organization it's been some good time years yeah. some good years and uh you know been surrounded with you know great athletes so Devonte adams and aaron Rodgers, uh, aaron jones people like that and so um you know kind of when you get in a rich culture like that you kind of feel like oh man like you get a taste of football history just by being in the building so oh i bet i have never been to lambeau field but um yeah i, I want to go someday um but basically, uh, you also played with DeAndre Hopkins out in Houston as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I, probably one of the, the the craziest athletes that I've ever seen, just from a gifted standpoint. Incredible mm -hmm. mind too, as well. Like you know, I think sometimes people don't understand. Uh, you really got to have a head on your shoulders to play at a high level, be oh, able yeah. to make quick, decisive decisions, and have like a kind of like analytical view of what you're doing out there on the field. So, but yeah, DeAndre, uh, great guy, great athlete. Yeah, yeah I and mean, like the, um, I guess like a lot of plays that you guys have to memorize, right? Yeah. Every single season, and you've moved from, I think. Your first team was what Houston, mm -hmm. or was it Jacksonville? Yeah, yeah so uh, Houston spent some some time there. Spent three years there. Spent some time with the Jaguars for about a year, and then some uh, additional years on the back end of my career with the uh, Packers. Yeah. Right, and so for each place, you have to learn a new style of offense. Yeah. I think maybe the only one where you kind of had a go over was with Nathaniel Hackett going from the Jaguars mm -hmm. to Green Bay. Is that right? 
Yeah, see, I see. I, I know you're a, a, a buff, right? So, uh, you know, Coach Hack, he was great. But, yeah, he did kind of have that correlation of, you know, that offense on the Jaguars transition a little right. bit with the Packers, some different things. But, yeah, man, sometimes when you're on a new team freshly, you've got a, a task of learning a whole new playbook. Sometimes it's the same, but in often cases it's completely different. So, right. um, yeah. And like those playbooks are what, like 50, 100 pages? Oh gosh, yeah. I couldn't even tell you, man. More than, more than 100 <laughs> pages. And it's just like very minute details of like, all right, like, you know, your stance and then, you know, how to evaluate a defense and then how to react to this coverage versus that coverage, versus all these different aspects of the game. So uh, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the love of the game is part of it. But like I said, you really got to be able to have a passion for it to even want to dive into a playbook that much because most people would look at a playbook and be like, I have no interest, you know? And so, right. yeah, it's one of those <laughs> things to where, you know, you, know, you got to put in that time and that sacrifice to go out there and play well. Yeah, exactly. I uh, And you were, like you said, like a, a skilled position player on the offense. So uh, you can't just learn like basic concepts. You have to learn routes and you have to like read defenses and stuff like that. Whereas um, for me, I was playing uh, middle linebacker in the last year of high school. Before that, I was playing basketball and wasn't, you know, a hard position to learn from a technical standpoint, right? You're just like, basically read what the offense is doing you have a yeah, few yeah. you know zones or whatever you're in i mean it was high school so it's not like you know complex <laughs> either um but generally speaking you know um would you say the offense is a lot harder to learn than the defense oh yeah yeah i, I would say it is because there's more structure involved with uh creating the offense that does well because you have right. 11 positions and they all have to work together like in a synthesis in a symphony to get like a good outcome for that play and right. defense you're kind of like, okay, we have these certain sets, but we're just reacting to what the offense does. So I would say, you know, the smart guys are on offense. I'm just put it out there. But, you know, <laughs> if to play offense, you can't be a you can't be a guy that doesn't know anything, basically. Yeah. Even they put me uh on the line actually, uh and like I think as like a guard or something like that. And like that just moving across, like that was more complex than anything on the defense as well. So those linemen don't get enough respect. But oh no, um, yeah, respect the trenches. Yeah, definitely. But so how does that relate to crypto? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so kind of like what I was saying before, like understanding what you're seeing, right, is a big thing. So when you're kind of evaluating crypto and looking at, OK, am I going to go with this coin versus a shit coin 5000? It's kind of like, OK, well, yeah, I'm not just trying to look and say, hey, how much money can I make in a quick amount of time? I'm looking at, hey, kind of how can I make the best decision for what my goals are to produce a good outcome? So that's a lot of what football is is being able to evaluate things, kind of use your skill set. So whether you're not recharged, whether you know how to, you know, look at on-chain data like Plan C, whatever it is that you feel like, you know, you're trying to get a foothold within, utilizing what you learn in your and your time that you spend to benefit you by making great decisions. And then so when it comes with money, uh, I, I what I've seen, especially I've invested into other things for crypto, is people, even in crypto, people only have a mindset of like, okay, what can I basically put my money in that's going to make me a millionaire and right. so and you like got to re-engineer your thinking it's like tomorrow right and i think you really need to re-engineer your thinking and say okay i just want to be successful in finance first and foremost okay now yeah. what does that look like to me how do i get there and then so like that's a whole thought process and then you put action behind it and that's all of what athletics is it's kind of like okay well i have passion here right so i would hope that people have somewhat of a passion for their personal finance because that's their livelihood i'm not saying you got to go crazy or look at it every single day but you should say okay hey i gotta you know kind of get things going here um which i know a lot of these guys in the moon gang are doing right they're working hard yep. but then it's about creating a plan of saying okay cool now that i kind of have an idea of like where i want to go like now it's time to get into action and then so you know when you put in the time for like workouts for football or you know you're learning the playbook that's your prep time and then you go out there and you got to perform and try to produce a good outcome and you work together right so you're working with other teammates and then so here in the moon game you know so you dcc and you know like Clancy, all the guys that you have on like, the show yep. all the information that you guys are providing is a, is a way for us to uh or anybody that's watching to say all right cool i can take that put that tool in my uh wheelhouse and utilize it for my personal uh, success because we all know crypto is a personal thing. You know, we're not all looking at each other's portfolio or anything like that, but we can all kind of take information that each one of us is putting out there and utilize it to uh, gain better personal finance here. So, yeah, that's part of the hive mind with the Cultivate Crypto uh, and Dollar Cost Crypto Crypto Mindset yeah. course, right? Yeah. Um, can you just kind of mention like how, how, like, 
I always find it hilarious when I'm having a consultation with somebody or when I'm just having a chat with somebody who's in the course. I'm just like, how did you find us on the internet? Right. Cause it's like, there's so many, you know, different places for information out here. It's yeah. just like, you know, how do you, how did you land upon the crypto mindset course? And then like kind of tell people your journey, I guess, because you were already in financial markets before the crypto mindset course, you were in real estate um, and probably in stocks, I think equities you were mentioning before. Um, but like, how did you leverage what we basically do in the course for uh, taking that knowledge that you had before and then applying it to cryptocurrency? Yeah. Um, so like briefly, so when I went to college, uh, I basically minored in business finance, majoring in communications. And so I've always had a, a knack for like numbers and kind of looking at things very objectively. And so as I kind of, I guess you can say, came into a different uh, tax bracket, so to speak, you know, because yeah. my, my career and stuff like that, that was definitely a, a different shock of being able to, you know, navigate with that. We can probably talk about that later. But then um, I jumped into real estate pretty, pretty quickly. So like my dad, he's a builder, so he's been building houses for a long time. So I've been around it from the aspect of like knowing how it's done, but not from the investment side. But I invested right. pretty heavily early on into real estate um, and equities as well. And one thing that I uh, took a, a liking to was basically multifamily real estate. So okay. kind of like having multiple doors, that whole thing, you know, the whole Grand Cardone, blah, 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 all that stuff. But <laughs> at the hey, same time, he, does, he, he makes it work. I mean, it's a good yeah, it's yeah. A method that works. If it works, it, it is. Works, right? Well, it, and so the one thing that's in particular about that, that's pretty good now, you know, this is we're going to talk about crypto here, but briefly is like yeah. the availability to basically get multiples on your capital due to like the you know the stuff that you're doing within it right so you have multiple doors here you have basically multiple streams of revenue within one shelf basically and you could you know create value out of that by doing certain types of renovations and stuff like that and so right. i've always gravitated towards okay if i'm going to be putting my money into something i want it to be exponential and so i got pretty good at that within real estate uh so spent you know about four or five years doing nothing but just flipping multifamily properties and kind of having a lot of success there. And then I'm like, okay, well, what else is out here as far as what can I do with my capital? And so blah, 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 da, da, da. crypto came upon my, <laughs> my radar. And it's very interesting because I'm kind of looking at this stuff during training camp, um, you know, while I was with the Packers, I'm just like, man, you know what? I know I need to be focusing on this playbook, right? But mm. there's crypto, there's something here, <laughs> there's something here, right? Hey, so it's, I, it's, it's interesting, right? Yeah. And then so I just started getting pulled in. But at the same time, I'm just kind of doing what a lot of people do uh, when they first kind of jump in. It's like, OK, well, let me just get some Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. I did that. And I started seeing the exponential rise of Bitcoin, especially during that COVID dip and things just kind of going up. Yeah, I was investing. And I was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. And then slowly started to add to the portfolio with Ethereum. But at this time, I was like, you know what? I'm putting money here. I'm making money here. But do I understand everything I need to understand here? Because if I'm making money like this, I want to be here long term. Right. And so I started just, you know, scouring YouTube, you know, just doing my Googles. And believe it or not, I, I came across your website. I was like, oh, hopefully crypto. Interesting. And started kind of looking at things. And you know, I seen that you had a YouTube channel, started watching. And so just like a lot of these guys here, uh, yep. got some valuable content and information. And then I was like, you know what? I got to dive in even harder. So, you know, that first uh, crypto mindset course that I was kind of, um, like on the bridge, I was like, I don't know if I need to take this. Man, one of the best financial decisions that I ever made because it really started to open up my perspective really on why crypto is such a valuable asset and then kind of what are things going to be coming down the pipe to have a lot of, uh, I guess you can say, confidence to say, hey, I'm willing to stay in this market to get that golden nugget at the end. So, Yep, get on that Citadel, baby. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah, no, it's good. And, you know, you've put in a lot of work um, to basically, you know, understand the markets and, yeah. and that stuff. So I want to show that to everybody here today. Um, yeah. Before we do, we will get to the uh, normal segments, which we do on the show. I always ask the people that I interview whether they want to do memes or not. So serve the dips into the memes. So let's do the memes. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and, then, and then just a side note, guys, it's like crypto is one like because mind you, um, I'm full time crypto now. So I've been full time crypto for some time. And I basically left a seven figure type job yep. to be full time in crypto because I understand the value proposition that's here. And yep. so um, respect, man. what was it an easy decision? 
Uh, no, but at the same time, I'm just kind of like, okay, what I can make this kind of money and not get hit every day. Oh, that's interesting. Right. And <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, crypto, I mean, we're all here for a reason. Like we're, we're going to get to these goals, but staying the course is very important. So, you know, yeah. Was there anybody in your family or friends who tried to talk you out of it? Uh, a little bit. Like my, my mom was like, oh, you sure. Like, you know, you, you've been doing this because I've been playing ball since I was like seven years old. So just yeah. imagine uh, you're doing something for, you know, long time. And then you're kind of just like, oh, there's this new thing on the block. Eh, I'm going to just leave my job and go. Like she was kind of skeptical at first. And then, you know, as I kind of started telling her about, okay, well, hey, this is how this stuff works and, you know, limited supply and blah, blah, blah. And then we get into like all this understanding of like the Fed and how they're printing money, all these things. And she's just like, eh, I mean, sounds good. So, all right, cool. All right, so she's always been very supportive in everything I'm doing. So, Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah um just uh take a look at the chat real quick before we jump into the memes um just to say hi to a few people in the community so we got marlon gillis uh number one moon in the chat today is saying shoo so good to see i can't put that one on the screen because it was i think the first one today um oh, we got a super chat here from kk the regular once a month i think on thursdays uh happy june thanks charlie uh hit like for the moon gang appreciate it uh reminds me to put up a banner as well uh, let's see. And Angel in the chat. Yes, sir. We are live. Yes, this is hundred percent. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 I think we had, yeah, there's somebody, oh, I have to scroll up for this comment, but there was somebody, um, well, there's Colladine knows who you are. Says Tyler Irvin is a fellow moon ganger. He's crypto of course, uh, an algo service veteran. Perfect. Um, but there was also another one, uh, where was this? I can't see it, but it's basically somebody saying, Hey, we should, we should interview the, Oh, this was the one. So he says, interview that running back from, uh, the Ravens. Yeah. Justice Hill. He's yeah, Mexican. Yeah. Tyler's so Mexican, man. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll yeah. Been for quite some time, but yeah, me and justice, uh, we're, we're good friends. I actually talked to nice. justice like a few weeks ago. So yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I might be able to cue that up. So how many hexagons are there in the NFL? Ah, uh, to be honest. I think there's a, a, a handful, right? Um, yep. Personally, I probably know two other than myself. Solid. So it's a start, but yeah, now we got to raise that awareness, man. We got to raise that awareness. Yep, yep. And uh, yeah, looking good here. So uh, yeah, it looks like a few people who recognize you. I've talked to you in the, the chats before, also in the Algo service. Um, so yeah, let's get into the memes and then um, we'll be getting in. It looks like some people have some questions for you as well. So we'll get into the questions uh once we've gotten through uh the different stuff that we want to talk about here today so um i'll just share the screen of the memes i think there is one with sound so uh i'll do that all right into from infinity into beyond or i don't even know what what that is anymore uh <laughs> i forgot that <laughs> phrase from infinity to beyond or whatever the fuck you know the buzz light your says yeah. um but uh here we got the uh <laughs> first meme here for today um, with Solana. So yeah, there there may have been some issues with Solana recently. Uh, Solana can scale. How do we know if they're actually dead or just pretending? Uh, let's just say this, Solana can scale. <laughs> Everybody's laughing. <laughs> yeah, uh, there we go. Pretty easy. Nice. A little rusty here on the memes myself, so I'll let you take this next one. Uh, this is a good one here. All right, here we go. So, you know, typical thing, dev, eat that dip. Also, dev, out of here. Nowhere to be found. <laughs> Got ghosts. <Peace. laughs> not bad, not bad. That one didn't have sound in particular, but yeah. yeah. Don't know what coin that is, but rip. Uh, this one has some sound. This one's just classic, but uh, renditioned for uh, stepping holders. Can you hear that? When I put, yeah, can you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna make it big. <laughs> no, it only went halfway, but you get the you get the point. I think basically it's it's uh, gonna buffer the rest up. Oh, it looks like maybe we can get through it. Damn. That's hilarious. <laughs> Step in in a casket. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Hey, it's not that bad. Look, yeah. I've seen I've seen worse, you know. 
So basically this came up here, I think what, to like 340? Yeah, it's still worth something. Not as bad as Luna. <laughs> Oof, yeah, no. Nah. Luna's a different story. Yeah. I'll jump on this one. Uh, guys, stop asking me about Bitcoin. The only thing you can do with it is uh, to buy it cheap, sell it to the next person at a higher price. Now, please don't inter interrupt me. I'm busy paying stocks, or sorry, I'm busy paying stocks at cheap price uh, to sell higher later. Exact yeah, same thing. Okay. Markets work in the exact same way. Exactly. Exactly. That's but uh, jump on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, a total of 4.5 million red envelopes were issued, each containing you know different levels of digital one. They will be randomly delivered to different citizens. The amount received can be spent both online and in regular stores. Let's see here. Okay, I don't know who you are, but I will find you and give you eighteen dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, nah, I don't think that's eighteen dollars you want to be be given. Yeah, you don't want that Skynet coin. That's for damn sure. Nah. <laughs> nope. And, uh, you know, this is a uh, hashtag, not financial advice, but you know, it's basically risk-free talking about basically <laughs> pretty sure it is pretty, pretty sure. And, uh, last but not least go for it. My crypto wallet. Ah, I got the bears on you, but here's the one thing though. Um, in my time as being a Packer, the bears will never get to you. Just got to keep going. <laughs> never, you're never going to lose, right? Just keep with the game plan. Bears won't get to you. So that's true. Yeah. That's true. The only, I think, uh, who is their defensive line guy? Uh, I can't remember from back in the day, but they had a few good players. But yeah, yeah the whole yeah, team. Had some guys. Yeah. And there's no chance they'll catch you. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. <laughs> so not bad. Not bad. But I would say, you know, good first try on the memes here. Um, you, it, it's always funny doing the memes with other people. So uh, we always give it a good shot. But um, we got Pepe Gen Zero versus saying uh, the Bears. Yeah, the Bears. I, I think uh, Eric Chavez out here is, is uh, rooting for the Bears. But uh, yeah, we. That's that's one thing we can agree on. Uh, they're never they're gonna ever gonna win the division again. So, um, but yeah, uh, I want to okay. take a look at the markets. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was saying, hey, they might in some fantasy land, but in reality, <laughs> nah. <laughs> so I, I think it's Vikings and Packers this year. Um, you guys get division, we get wild card, uh, we win the Super Bowl. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> How about that? Um, but yeah, no, I wanted to. Then obviously we usually jump into the markets, but I wanted to kind of get your uh, perspective on the current market with Bitcoin. Um, we do this when anybody who's you know pretty good at uh, looking at the markets. Uh, comes on the show. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen and kind of telling us what you're seeing with Bitcoin right now. Yeah, yeah. So one second, let me go ahead and share the screen. Got some Eagles fans out here. All right. All right. All right. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, um, so yeah, this is just like a, a basic view, a macro for Bitcoin and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just the biggest thing, like we all know, it's just like up and through time, up and to the right. And just kind of in recent time, you want to kind of take this last chunk here. Obviously, uh, you know, we're in like that consolidation. And so, you know, there's this argument or hey, or was this like the, the end of the, the bull run? Or are we just going into a bear market? But it really just looks like we have an extended period of time of consolidation. Um, yep. I think one of the, the main topics that I kind of want to kind of get into today. So if you guys can kind of get the contour of what I'm saying, um, you know, it, it may kind of be a little bit different than probably what Charlie talks about most of the time. I know he's specifically crypto based, but we're going to kind of look at the correlation between the stock market, because I think a lot of people talk about it. But I don't know if people actually know how to like quantify it and look at it like objectively and seeing how it actually even works. And so here at the bottom, you know, I have this indicator It's basically built to basically see how high is the correlation between specifically the S&P. 500 and there's also one for the nasdaq because those are the two i guess you can say sectors of the stock market that are like highest correlated to bitcoin in general yep. and so what, what we can see is especially through time but like really since like 2020 but even before that the correlation has always been there but it's just fluctuated through time but really we see that correlation being a lot higher uh, these past few years and so really since like the beginning of 2022 we've seen this correlation be 
you know, very high. And so right now we're in like the 90th percentile, uh, right about 91% as far as like the correlation following the stock market with Bitcoin. And so, yeah, we're just consol consolidating. And I just really think at these price levels, it's a great time to be having uh, your accumulation like cap on, like have that on and like understand like where, where things are going. And so not being this game for just like three or six months, but really being this thing for three to five years. And generally you'll yield some good outcomes when you kind of have that time preference. So. Right, right. Yeah. Time preference is a huge thing. Um, thinking about kind of, like you said, the correlation here, uh, you said this is the S and P or the NASDAQ one. Uh, yeah. So I have the S and P up, but the cool thing. So if you know, if you guys are fond of trading, you, you can kind of come in and it's called the correlation coefficient and you can kind of play around with it. Like we can do, uh, the NASDAQ as well and just kind of see, okay, you know, how are they lining up? And I can tell you they're, they're very similar, right? So same yeah. thing now with the NASDAQ, same thing, 92% here for um how high that correlation is and really you know since 2020 specifically that correlation has been pretty high except a few deviations to where uh kind of crypto um kind of got decorrelated but that was only for a span of maybe about like three or four months right so yeah not to the positive part of the trend either <laughs> yeah yeah unfortunately crypto took a little bit more of a dip during this period uh in 2021 during the summertime so well that's the volatility aspect right so there's um Crypto is extremely volatile, so you're going to get more volatility to the upside as well as the downside. So it will overshoot um, traditional markets in that sense. Like when the, you know they might Bitcoin might go down a little bit longer, um, not all the time, but sometimes. And then yeah. um, also here with the core, but you know to the upside, it's like you know the returns that you get here in crypto just yeah. comparatively I mean, is ridiculous. Yeah, if we just, I mean, we can just go back one cycle. So, you know, everybody kind of, if you're kind of a, a history buff with you in crypto, which I would encourage people to go look back at previous time before you were in the market and kind of see what happened. But, you know, if you kind of look at this run in 2000, you know, 15 to 17, even if you take like that last chunk in 2017 and you just kind of see some of the exponential gains just within Bitcoin, and you know, twenty x—that's not too shabby for any type of a uh, profit, right? So, yep. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, obviously, looking at the different altcoins and seeing, okay, well, what are the the safe capabilities for some of those as well? And um, you know, yeah, just crypto is just a, a great place to be if you know how to kind of maneuver within these different ebbs and flows. Well, and then thinking about like the current scenario, because right, we've been like we like you said, just in that chopping range um, for about a year now. Generally speaking, right now, um, I mean, how are you seeing the other markets and like what kind of things are you using to quantify those moves as well? Because Bitcoin's obviously not the only market that's been basically going down since the beginning of the year, especially with the rate hikes, right? Um, you got yeah, real yeah. estate as well as equities um, doing the same thing. So since you've been in those areas as well, kind of how do you see um, those markets and, and, you know, kind of how they relate to crypto? Yeah. And so like kind of like how I like to just look at asset classes in general, I like to start with like biggest and then condense down to the smaller asset classes. So, you know, obviously crypto as of right now, what is the I would say in total, we're probably what about one point three or one point five trillion somewhere in there. Right. Um, and that's relatively small compared to other asset classes, especially compared to the stock market. You know, that's a, over 100 trillion. Real estate is, you know, crazy amount, you know, several hundreds of trillions. But the largest I would say a uh, market that we're kind of dealing with is the credit and the debt market, you know? And so being able right. to understand that and say, okay, the credit market is a huge indicator of kind of how liquidity is being moved around. And then so a big thing to kind of look at is the Fed, okay? What are they doing with the Fed? Are they contracting or are they expanding with their liquidity? And so as we know right now, basically since December, uh, there's been a lot of quantitative tightening uh, and the economy, especially in the United States and even uh, across the entire world. And so when there's quantitative tightening, basically credit and debt is more expensive to get. You know, interest rates are, are going to be going up and they're doing that to get inflation down. And then so with that being said, that has an impact across global markets. And so kind of what I like to look at is uh, what we'll do today is kind of look at the stock market in particular 
and we'll just kind of look and see, okay, well, how is that correlation affecting Bitcoin? And we'll look at some of the derivative space within stocks. And then we'll kind of just look at different metrics that I've been kind of um, looking at for quite some time and seeing specific dates as far as, okay, this is giving us an indication of just good quality or a good time period of saying, hey, maybe I want to start looking at DCA a little bit heavier or taking profits at specific times because of what we're seeing in the stock market. So makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And for Bitcoin at the moment, what we've seen here since, um, I mean, I guess when you look at the chart just like this, like what, what are some of the first things you see in terms of kind of where we are um, and what tools do you mainly use um, for yourself in your analysis? Yeah, man, I, I use quite a few things. So, I mean, just in general, like, you know, just looking at RSI is a, a really good indicator, right? So if we kind of pop on the RSI here and we're just looking at, okay, just relative strength. So as far as trend what's happening within the asset and so as you can see when we come down to this bottom portion down to like this level of 30 or close to it typically these are just very valuable times great advantageous times to be purchasing bitcoin and thus crypto right and so if you kind of look at you know where we've been in recent time 2020 COVID dip we got to you know right around like that 33 and then he, we're back here again and we're kind of curling back up so have we hit a bottom? There's no way of 100% knowing if anybody says, hey, you know, the bottom is in and I know that 100% not telling you the truth because you know, no one <laughs> exactly. knows what's going to happen tomorrow. But we can you know, go on a bounce of probabilities, especially when we have recent data and time and kind of try to form a, a thesis and kind of how we can pivot within where we're at within the market. So that's my whole thing is like, how can we. Uh, do what we need to do and make the moves that we need to make now for the long term to give ourselves a good chance. And typically, you know, kind of looking at RSI, uh, we've uh, been able to see, you know, these have just been great times to start dollar cost averaging into the market. And typically you'll yield good results, especially when you get overextended above uh, the category of like 70 on the top end of this metric or just at least hitting it. Right. So, yeah. And, and so in the 2020 Corona crash, um, where where did that RSI get to? And so if we're just comparing, uh, we're kind of looking at right here about, you know, like 34 and a half, give or take. So and, where uh, we right now? and right now we're looking at even lower. Right. And so we're looking at we right around 33. And so, you know, uh, I think a lot of people are definitely fearful. I think this was a lot more drastic as far as swiftness and how quickly the price went down. And this has kind of mm -hmm. been more of like a, a slow grind. So if we kind of look right from the top. Uh, you know, we're, we're down considerably, right? So if you're buying tops, which none of us here in the moon game, hopefully <laughs> we're doing, uh, nope. you know, cause there's no, ways to just kind of start understanding the stuff to where you prevent yourself from doing that, honestly. Yep. Um, but you know, if you bought the top, you're down about 56%. And so for some of these altcoins, you know, you're down, who knows, 70, 80%, right? So right. to mitigate that risk, uh, understanding, you know, I love what you're doing on the show, kind of being able to track those six day cycles and to get like that lower portion within that six day time frame of saying, hey, here's like more advantageous time. Typically, it'll keep you from buying those tops as well, too. So gotcha. And where what was your first cryptocurrency that you bought in? Um, uh, around what time did you buy it in this trend? Yeah, yeah. So Bitcoin was my first. So I started paying attention here in 2019. Um, like definitely heavily inv invested in real estate at the time and then so i started seeing some rumblings of price going up and and soon as i seen this COVID stuff happen i'm just like okay you know i know a little bit about this crypto don't know everything but i know when there's panic in the streets i need to allocate money i did know mm -hmm. that and then so i didn't catch this exact bottom but i started dcaing all within this time frame here like especially during the summer so like training camp was really during this time here in like early uh june mid July. And so I did a lot of investing here, but I started investing here on this uprise here. And um, Bitcoin was like primarily what I was investing in. And from there, uh, added Ethereum to the portfolio and, you know, was able to really get a lot of those juicy gains and experience that uprise uh, during 2020. So that was pretty cool to kind of experience. But now, you know, in 2021, there's been some chop. And so my education level uh, definitely obviously kind of tracking with you and a lot of the, the people in the crypto space. We actually know what we're talking about. Um, I started to develop my own methods of evaluating things to mm. produce good outcomes as well. And, you know, it's been a very interesting year, but, you know, I'm in this thing long term. So, you know, I'm not in it for just this short time frame. You know, same thing like we've been talking about. You know, we're in it for like the, the whole gist of, you know, years. So, you know, that's what I'm looking forward to. Definitely. And, and so, um, yeah, I think that studying that you've done since you got in is, 
you know, you've dedicated yourself to it. Like, like you said, like you do um, with sports, you just look at it like, okay, this is what I got to study here today. This is, you know, break it down into chunks and, and, you know, um, take it, uh, you know, uh, run with it basically. So um, I think there's a few other moon gangers I've had consultations with. I think Greg Fowler was another one who I saw basically within three to six months. Um, Yeah. He just took crypto extremely seriously and, and had his own methods as well by that time. So, you know, it really is not that hard in my opinion. I mean, it takes dedication, but it's really, you know, just having that patience, perseverance, knowing how useful and important this asset class is, where it's going and just having that conviction um, yeah, yeah. really gets you into wanting to study this. So what were you, what are now, I guess, your main tools and how, what do you, because, so you basically showed RSI here as like kind of a indicator um, mm-hmm. that one of them that you use, but if you were to try to tell us, you know, kind of where we're at in Bitcoin's pattern and uh, what you think is coming next, um, what tools and, and, I mean, you can just go through it with your analysis or show us the tools that you're using and, and explain those however you want to do it. Um, yeah, but yeah. I'm just kind of curious about that because everybody kind of comes up with their own tool set that fits their personality, right? Like for me, you know, I chose um, the 60 day cycles for time. I chose Elliott waves um, and then I chose um, uh, for price, just, you know, support resistance measures and then, you know, whatever oscillator, you know, it works on that day is useful, but yeah, yourself, for sure. like how do you break that down? Yeah, for sure. So I use a lot of that same stuff. Um, but like I was mentioning before, when correlation is as high as it is, right, I kind of start to look back at traditional markets and say, okay, you know, right. since those markets are a lot larger than crypto, they're going to lead crypto, you know, 99% of the time, you know, especially what's yep. going on over there. So I tend to focus on a few metrics uh, within that space to kind of evaluate kind of what may possibly be happening within the crypto market in the uh, like the near future, but then also even long term as well. So there's a metric that I've kind of uh, created here and um, I can go ahead and explain it just a little bit more in, in detail. But basically, yeah. this is the put to call ratio. And so if you guys don't know too much about the option space or the derivative space in um, stock market, basically a put is agreeing to sell a asset at a certain price. And then so if it gets to that strike price, it's your asset to sell at that particular price in time. And then vice versa, a call is buying a particular asset at a certain price. And you're basically putting that contract in forth beforehand, right? And so, yeah. I was gonna say, so if you did not write that down, pause the video. And go back or or at least timestamp the that area because i think there's a yeah, lot of people yeah. out there who are in crypto that don't, don't understand even the basics of traditional markets right like mm-hmm. you know puts and calls are, are really important to the traditional market and yeah. yeah that explanation was perfect so um yeah take us through this yeah and so basically this is a basically a chart that i mocked up here and we're using like a moving average for the put to call ratio here in this yellow line so that's the main line that we'll be paying attention through uh paying attention to through time and we have like these different levels right so this green line here this is kind of like a representation of extreme fear and panic so this is when markets are dumping people are like i don't know what the heck is going on everybody's like fire selling and things are just looking very bearish and then vice versa here in red that means you know there's extreme greed and complacency. People think things are just going to keep going up forever. And then so kind of these are different pivot points, right? And in between, mm-hmm. you kind of have this midline of saying, hey, generally, we're kind of oscillating above or below this line. And here in the dotted like yellow lines, here are these, like, these specific pivot points that I've been able to kind of realize, hey, typically, once we get around these portions, there's a turn in trend. And then so this top portion represents meaning there's a lot of puts in the market. So meaning a lot of people are believing that the market's going down, therefore they're putting in their put. And then here at the bottom, when this metric kind of starts touching this dotted line or even this red line, people are extremely optimistic about the market saying, hey, you know, we're going to go ahead and put these calls in saying, hey, we believe the the market's going to be trending higher. And so one thing that we'll notice if we're trying to kind of understand different time, right? As far as okay pivot points of where we see that time uh turnaround as far as trend with price uh what i have here are these specific data points in time and so we'll kind of correlate this with the s p 500 and then correlate it also with bitcoin what we'll notice is there's a stream correlation with this metric when there's a lot of puts um especially kind of like COVID here and different instances uh, instances within the years 
And even now where we are today, when we kind of hit this like portion here and we kind of turn around typically and not always, but that is like a local low in that market. So that's the interesting point is kind of what I'll do is I'll pop up the S&P 500 and what we'll be able to see with these particular dates is when we kind of get that curve and that turnaround with this metric, typically that's a turnaround also in price. And so if we kind of look here at the bottom and we kind of follow this through time and we can, I mean, this metric goes back for a long time. We can all go all the way back until, you know, 2008, 2009, but mm. really, you know, we can look back here. So if you kind of look at this metric, so a lot of puts in the market, and then it kind of gets turned around. But once we get this to this dotted line, we see that's the local low. Same thing here with this portion here. We get to this level, turn around, local low here. Same thing here. We're kind of like shuttling a little bit above the, the dotted line. But nonetheless, we kind of curve back down. And same thing here, local low, local low. And then we can just kind of track it. And so we kind of move on to 2018. And so this white line here has been a uh, resistance, I would call it, for this metric. And we're kind of here today as well. So local low. Uh, and these are clear and defined, right? These are specific timelines, right? So we're on the week or mm. the daily chart here for this metric. And then so same thing here. This COVID got to this dotted line. And that was like a, a crazy capitulation. But a lot of puts in the market. And then, you know, with this particular date, when this kind of rolled over, that was the local low, right, for COVID dip. And so right. kind of if we kind of want to look and see where we're at today with this metric, same thing here. We kind of got to this white line and we started to curl over and we're seeing that local low form within the S&P 500 starting to bounce back up. And so this indicator has been very helpful because since we know the correlation is very high for Bitcoin, we can also kind of see, OK, well, with this metric, if it kind of curls over and hits this midline and then kind of accelerates to this dotted line, we can then feel more confident saying, OK, yeah, Bitcoin is kind of doing this thing. The crypto market is going to continue to stay in a sustained trend and it's not some type of like short momentary thing. And so what I'm kind of looking for is saying, OK, this is a, a lagging indicator. So. We'll see through time and if this starts to trend back up then what does that say hey we're not done with the the dip per se right and there may be a little bit more i guess you can say fear in the market and this metric will help show that and so price will follow and mm -hmm. if this continues to track towards this midline then we'll probably see price to uh, trend up as well and so we're just going to watch this and so you know obviously i can share the, these charts with anybody in the moon game who wants them to get in contact with me and um you know this stuff is like very helpful to kind of take a look at bitcoin from another view which i don't think a lot of people are doing right now yeah exactly so and, and yeah a lot of people can ask you for that um and you can share it within the uh, crypto mindset uh telegram chats as well and yeah. so where where do you think um just since we're looking at you know the macro markets here with the trad area um where do you think the S&P is going from here? Uh, just if you were to, you know, take a guess, because obviously, you know, nobody knows, yeah. as we said before, but, you yeah. know, probabilities and, and, you know, taking a stab at it is definitely um, where money is to be made. Yeah, I mean, I think the gist of it, right, um, and that's something I actually didn't mention, is really it's just like, hey, with your DCAs, what are the more advantageous times to do so? So obviously in these dip portions, right, because if you're DCAing through time and you're not like a lump sum investor, so only investing at one a point in period but if you spread that out through the years what are the most advantageous times and then mm -hmm. so with this metric really like leaning into that extreme fear and panic so anytime that we're up here at these upper levels i mean great time to start dcaing um maybe at a higher level than what you were doing previously and especially once we get to these uh lower levels here or i guess you can say you know higher levels in price for extreme greed these are the areas where it's very advantageous to take profits right and so as you can kind of see um, you start like if you're DCAing here at these levels, you're for sure being profit, right? Um, and I don't like to guarantee anything, but the probability of you being in profit is very high if you're kind of looking at this metric and looking at it objectively and utilizing it the right way. And then so yeah, you can start to DCA, and then kind of when we see okay, the price gets higher, we see kind of this metric trend back more towards that fear level and then so it's kind of resetting your mind okay yeah i want to start to dca a little bit more versus what you would probably do in this area and i would really encourage people not to be dca when you know things are at all-time highs per se you should have been <laughs> yeah. you should have been doing that when prices were low right so exactly. that's the whole gist of like kind of understanding these metrics and using them to your advantage mm, and how did you uh like basically notice this pattern uh specifically 
uh, just hopping into the derivative space, into traditional finance. So I'm nice. um, looking at futures markets and uh, really using Glassnode and using a lot of that on-chain data to kind of put this together as well. So cool. Yeah, it gives it kind of gets the ju creative juices flowing. I think yeah. people don't realize that um, a lot when you're looking at markets, you really have to kind of think outside the box and kind of mm, try to come up with a new angle of looking at things because a lot of people just kind of end up looking at the same stuff. And yep. then you kind of get the herd mentality. So if you really want that edge or you want to kind of, you know, beat the market per se, or at least get a, a couple steps ahead, right? Yeah, um, sure. Coming up with those things is massively important. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. But to answer okay. your question though, let's, let's hop over to the VIX. So to kind of get an idea of like what the volatility uh, within the stock market is looking like, that's a important, important thing to kind of look at because that does translate over to Bitcoin when the correlation is high. So, right. The VIX is, you know, something that, you know, it's not really like looking at like a particular price within the, the stock market, but it's looking at the volatility. So typically volatility is highest when prices are going down, uh, especially within the stock market. Mm -hmm. And so if you kind of look at the two outliers, right? So same thing, we had COVID, that's more recent time. And we can kind of look at these boxes, kind of kind of get the top of that wick and saying, okay, the volatility just went crazy during these times. So this is like at a level of about like 77. Same thing here back in 2008 with the financial crisis of 94. But these are more so outliers kind of, you know, we, we traditionally don't see things like this. Not saying that it can't happen again, but what we see with the bulk of the volatility when things do get extended and to the downside, and then we kind of see a, a turn in price and volatility, it's kind of like this high volatility zone of kind of what I've labeled here. And so typically within this zone, and same thing, if you kind of realize with these specific dates, they also line up with the PCC, the put the call ratio, as far as great advantageous times to be, you know, DCA into an asset. And so, you know, as we kind of look through time, we kind of have uh, this metric basically in between about like 50 ish and kind of like on the low end of 30. And we're just kind of looking for that particular week or maybe consecutive weeks of where we just have that high volatility. And, and what we notice is it doesn't last long. And then we'll kind of see that volatility lower. And then when volatility is actually lower in the stock market, that means price is actually ripping to the upside. Right. And so it's very interesting because if we look now and I kind of have this box because we've kind of been hitting and really, I mean, honestly, you know, since the beginning of the year specifically, we've been hitting this zone of the like higher volatility, like and maintaining it. And so that's a little bit different than what we've seen before. And that's kind of like, you know, kind of look back here. Same situation is kind of how we had that larger chunk. But then once that kind of got out the way, it's a very big rush uh, to like the lower end of volatility. But like I said before to uh the higher price points uh kind of being attained within the stock market and so this is something i'm going to be looking at over like the next couple of weeks couple of months to see if we kind of have like one more wick of volatility and that may be something to look at as well to say okay cool and then we kind of rush back down into like lower volatility yeah and that's a good way to phrase the question as well which is so what do you need to see i think you know um when I explain the charts, right, you got to explain what you uh, see in the market with conviction, right? You got to basically be like, okay, um, th if this, then that, but, you know, I have one scenario that I'm kind of going with, but there's other possibilities as well, right? So, yeah. yeah. So for yourself, like, that's probably the best way to phrase the question, right? Because sometimes, you know, saying just definitively, like, I think this is going to happen in the market, you know, kind of puts you out there in terms of, you know, um, being wrong. And I think it's important to be able to be wrong. Like everybody in the market is going to be wrong at some point. Um, sure. but you know, the, the goal here, it's kind of like playing baseball, right? Um, yeah. obviously, you know, for baseball, you know, if you have a 300%, uh, or sorry, 30%, uh, hit rate, you're good. Uh, in terms of trading, right. You're making money if you're doing 51%, you know, so you're winning yeah, you know, yeah, more yeah. than losing essentially. Right. So, um, the, what I want to phrase that into is a couple different questions, but one, um, with the current situation, what do you need to see for a turnaround and what would you look for in these metrics that you're showing here for continuation of the downtrend? And yeah. then, uh, what is your kind of like main scenario of what you're seeing? Uh, and then how that shapes into Bitcoin as well. I know that's a lot to kind of take yeah, out. Yeah. I'm trying to remind you of the question as we're kind of going along here. Yeah. Some we, audience we can, might be we, jumping in. We can, we can tackle into it. 
And so same thing here. So what I did was I, I went ahead and popped up the uh, the S and P right here. So same thing. You know, we can see these dates, right? So high volatility also correspond to like that local low, local low. Same thing here, local low, high volatility, local low, and especially here with COVID, you know, with these particular dates, local low. These dates are literally the exact same dates for the PCC. So you know, you talk about a lot of confluence across different metrics and different evaluations. That's what we're getting here as we kind of take a look at uh, things from this nature. And so, kind of uh, for me to like continue to evaluate this metric, and so yeah, let me just pop off. Uh, this also can see a little bit easier mm -hmm. so kind of what i'm looking for like i mentioned before now if we stay in this like high, higher volatility range so uh, if you see this moving average here this is a a 20-day ema or actually a 20-week ema and so we're kind of sitting right here on top of it and so if we kind of zoom in a little bit and we see that we kind of came right back down and we're so we're kind of out of the high volatility zone what i'm going to look for is if we start creeping back up into that high volatility zone that's going to lead me to believe that hey we got some more downside but if we start mm -hmm. to see this kind of rush down and we spend consecutive uh, consecutive weeks there so you know really trying to look for you know a month or even two of just uh you know this metric being below this high volatility zone and then heading to the downside that's going to lead me to believe saying okay well hey maybe the worst of what we experienced is done with but there's no way to really know that beforehand and so right. as we look at the these things we're kind of just monitoring them to help us position ourselves and have a little bit more foresight of kind of how we're going to uh, play things for the long term really um and kind of using like this short term medium term assessment right Yep, hundred percent. So yeah, it's very interesting. And like we said before, since we're still highly correlated with uh, Bitcoin being highly correlated with uh, the stock market as well as the Nasdaq, um, you know, depending on how you're, which if you're looking at the S and P five hundred or if you're looking at the Nasdaq one hundred or you know whatever types of equities you're looking at. Um, one question here in the chat from Pepigen to zero over. I think what he means here is not exactly does it correlate with. Uh, maybe he means does this correlate exactly with the MVR V two? I would guess I would probably doubt that. Maybe you haven't looked at that, but in terms of, you were mentioning um, on-chain data before, um, do you kind of, I guess, when you're looking at either of the areas, do you see any similarities in either the analysis or the price action? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Like with the analysis, you're kind of seeing uh, a lot of similar things. For example, I was actually just uh, looking at the, the volatility index for Bitcoin because you know we're looking at the S and P for this metric here, but for example here on Glassnode, uh, you can kind of look at that volatility. So they call it the the BVIN, mm -hmm. and so you can kind of see you know with these particular spikes, sometimes it is to the upside, and then but sometimes but majority of the time where that volatility is highest is when we're rushing to that downside. And then so like, you know, 2020, that was a crazy upside bullish run. But, you know, when you have, like I said, we're looking for like these short time periods of like spikes, right? So like a chunk here, right? High volatility, a chunk here. You're, you're kind of seeing some correlation as well with, with Bitcoin. And so, you know, I would definitely say on-chain data is, I would say it's useful when the correlation isn't as high. I would mm. say the things more to focus on, to be honest, if I, if I want to say, uh, if you want to look at things objectively, right? So not with your emotion and saying, hey, I just want Bitcoin to go back up. So let me just look at all the things on Glassnode to say, hey, you know, <laughs> all these things are showing us that, you know, we're in a bull market or whatever the conversation might be, whether we're in a bull or a bear, that's right. another topic. But really just saying, okay, you know, like, what are we seeing across the board? Because, you know, when correlation is high, you know, we really need to like lean into like these metrics um, here in the stock market. And like I said, we can kind of look at some of the workforce stuff, maybe in, a, in another uh, show that you might be doing later on and just mm. kind of say, OK, these external factors in the macro, how are they weighing on the crypto market? And so um, I would say, yeah, like on-chain data is part of the analysis, but it would probably be a smaller chunk of it. And this is mainly looking at things from a macro sense. Right, exactly. It's a tool in the toolbox, but it's not an end-all, be-all, um, yeah. just with any other metric. So exactly. And <laughs> this is kind of funny. Uh, Sebastian in the uh, in the chat says, wait, is this really Tyler Irvin on the stream for real? <laughs> 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 so it looks like we got some fanboys in here. Yes, yeah. it is actually Tyler. You can see him there. He is he is here. <laughs> so, yes, yes, yes. Back. But the thing is, it's like, man, I, I love kind of just coming 
uh, with some type of value. And like my thing is because I can talk ball all day. We can shut all this crypto stuff and just talk ball for the rest of the stream if you want. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, right. but no, nah, like uh, to be honest, like I really just wanted to come bring value to the guys here on Moon Game because I know that I've gotten a lot of value here as well. And so um, anything that I can do to contribute, that's what, uh, you know, being an athlete is all about that, right? Just being able to contribute to a, a greater cause. Obviously, you know, within yourself, you want to do well for yourself, but then, you know, you realize that, you know, kind of adding value in a way to where people can benefit it from it. There's nothing like it, right? So I know that's why you're doing what you're doing here. Exactly. That's the whole point of what we're doing here. And so, you know, when I recognize talent in the Moon Gang, it's like, we got to get this out to everybody. So, um Awesome. But yeah, there's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> Doug Bass here. This is the right way to look at it. I think you mean Tyler Irvin, the crypto trader, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There you go. Like, like I said, look, I'm full-time crypto right now. So, you know, I, like I said, I could talk ball all day, but I prefer to say, okay, what is the crypto market doing as of right now? You know? Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. So yeah, it's, it's fun talking about this stuff. And I mean, we were talking earlier today about a lot of stuff in the market. We can't even fit everything that we want to talk about into a show. Cause we could just be talking all day about this stuff with how much, yeah. you know, I think people don't realize how much um, really goes into figuring out the markets because um, essentially, mm, you know, I mean, people on Wall Street do this their, for their entire career and everything like that. So oh, sure, uh, it is really sure. like a valuable skill. And can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Because um, we were talking about this a little bit before the stream, which is there's a lot of X players, right? They have a lot of money they don't know what to do with, or they're not managing it properly. Um, how do they, or how would you recommend somebody trying to get into like understanding markets, but they're like, man, I'm not quite as smart as Tyler. And I don't really know how to do this stuff. Like, where do I, where do I start? Yeah, I mean, so basically, uh, I basically call it sudden wealth syndrome. So, you know, for guys that get drafted into any professional sport, uh, kind of how it goes, if you get drafted higher, you know, so I, I was drafted decently high. And, you know, basically, when you're at a young age, they basically say, here's a whole bunch of money, right? Mm -hmm. And so beforehand, nobody tells you how to deal with it, how to manage it, how to even steward it and say, what do you, you know, do to grow it or basically not lose it. And so a lot of these guys, what I've seen over and over, especially like the younger guys coming into the league, is they squander it. And so right. that's the the big thing that, you know, you can kind of get in trouble with it. in crypto is like, yeah, you can make money very, very quickly. But if you don't know how to maintain it or manage it, what's the whole point of having it? Right. And so because it's going to fall through your hand. And so, yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is kind of like yeah. you can look at just a few examples, right? You look at uh, Emmett Smith, really good businessman, ah, has a lot yeah. of success. Out, out there right but then you look mm -hmm. at latrell spreewell when he was playing uh, at the end of his career he's like yeah, yeah. i need a contract i need like 20 million dollars because i need to feed my kids it's like uh yeah. how much money did you earn in your career right and so yeah, yeah. it's crazy how that amount of money can just like you know go out the door for for people who yeah. get it really quickly yeah because there's also a thing called the lifestyle creep like i, I got these right. different phrases that i use but the lifestyle creep is hey the more money you start making the more you start spending, your lifestyle starts to get much more luxurious. And yep. so, you know, having your uh, your balance of, yeah, it's cool to have stuff and, you know, spend money and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, if you're spending more money th than you're making, and then especially if the primarily the money that you've made is within an investment category, maybe not so much in a business that you can continue to replicate, right? Because with these markets, we don't know what they're going to do all the time. Like We can have an indicator of kind of the trend, but like how we've seen with COVID and different situations where things can kind of turn around in a moment's time. So if you're not pivoting yourself to be successful in a bear market or a bull market, you can lead yourself to some, some very tough times, right? And so um, like that's where I, I would say where I've spent a lot of my focus through the years of understanding how to pivot in between different markets, right? So whether it's real estate, stocks, or crypto, but mainly within crypto now, but basically trying to position myself to say, hey, I'll be able to weather any storm but give myself the right exposure to make hopefully, you know, the, the most amount of money risk adjusted, right. For my personal preference. Right. So. Right. hundred percent. And um, in terms of, so going back to that kind of that question, right. Cause there's a lot of people who are coming into wealth. Maybe they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to do this analysis. They just hire yeah. somebody to do it for them. You got to be careful with that. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So what's, what's kind of the, uh, the pitfalls there because there's also i've had some consultations with people right who are not professional athletes um but mm -hmm. who come into a big inheritance or something like that and especially if it happens at a young age um 
you know, I had a consultation with this guy and his uh, financial advisor, right? <laughs> you know how that's going to go. So yeah. um, the financial advisor is like, okay, I'm okay with crypto, but, you know, just kind of trying to kind of pull back the reins. As soon as he started talking about Hex, the financial uh, advisor's head just like, poof, you know, explodes. He's like, I think that's a little too risky, but um, yeah. like, how do you recommend somebody who's like that? like maybe like mid twenties, late twenties, um, who has that person in their ear, who's saying like all these negative things, like about crypto, can't get into this asset class or, um, also might be on the other end where, yeah. um, maybe they're not acting in the best interest of that person. Um, yeah. or they're over, uh, acting in the interest of the person and they're not letting them do enough to grow their capital. Like how do you balance yeah. that really? How yeah, man. So, so like kind of my story was, you know, so when I uh, got drafted, I had a, probably like over 10 financial advisors like hey let me show you this let me help you invest your money blah 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 and then so right. i interviewed them so what i would say anybody is say hey go ahead and say okay what's your value proposition and if they're only telling you about specific things that lead to their commission yep. you gotta kind of you know take a look at that and say hey do they have my best interest and so what i found out to be true is like sometimes you just got to find out for yourself first and typically when you find out for yourself you kind of see okay well you know maybe what they're talking about it, yeah it benefits me but it also benefits them and is it always at my best uh you know my, my best benefit right and so mm. what i've been able to see is a lot of these traditional finance guys man and, and no not to anybody that does that but uh typically they will show you products that basically have a vested interest in kind of increasing their personal bags as well. And so yep. crypto is not in that as of right now. I think through time it will be. But since we're kind of ahead of the, the trend for most people uh, learning to say, hey, let me just kind of figure some of this crypto stuff out myself. It'll give you that confidence to say, OK, cool. Or just like, a, you know, getting a consultation with with myself or, or Charlie or, or Greg or anybody who has some experience here, is especially learning how to deal with larger sums of money. Mm. Um, people that actually say, hey, you know what? I'm not necessarily going to be riding your wealth as you grow it. Basically, I can help you and teach you the concept of how to you know, do it yourself and kind of you can use me as a, I guess you can say, helping hand along the way, but not people that are saying, hey, I just want to show you stuff so I can just make money off you, basically. That's what's going on with a exactly. lot of financial advising. And so just having like that objective look as far as like people that you kind of let into your circle is, is very important. All right. And so, you know. And what if they're well-intentioned or good financial advisor, but they're just like on the uh, like they just hate crypto. It's just like, you know. Yeah. Like, don't get I mean, skin. it's just a, it's a personal decision you're going to have to make. Right. And so I'm never going to detour anybody away from say, hey, don't do this. Don't do that. It's just at least take a look. Yeah. So, you know, all you guys are here and you're learning about crypto and you're seeing some of the benefits and you're seeing some of the things that are, you know, quote unquote risky of what traditional finance doesn't understand because of this exact word here, volatility. But if you understand crypto in a whole, especially Bitcoin, if the volatility is going to the upside more than it's going to the downside, then volatility is your friend, really. And yep. so learning how to pivot uh, these different purchasing uh, time periods to where you want to be, say, hey, I want to purchase while prices are lower. And then obviously, you know, you have exponential gain compared to other markets solely because these market caps are a lot smaller, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and that also means more volatility to the upside, more money to be made, which is great. Um, yeah. And especially, like you said it earlier in the show, if your time horizon is long enough, then basically you'll be here for five, 10 years and you'll really make a lot of gains just with Ethereum and Bitcoin, but with other yeah, coins yeah. as well, that might stick it out of the course. So um, yeah. And the last thing I want to say, we're kind of, we'll kind of go back to your analysis here. We'll kind of thread that in through the conversation. But um, the other thing I wanted to ask that was kind of on that same uh, touch point is, um, I mean, the root problem there for a lot of people who are having financial advisors where they're not getting maybe the best information or maybe they're getting preyed upon or a lot of different scenarios, right? Um, kind of the root problem is they don't want to take it into their own, own hands, be self-sovereign, yeah. right? Yeah. They want to rely on somebody else. So what's your point of view on, I guess, getting a financial education when the traditional financial system doesn't really give you one? Yeah, I, I mean, I've always been a, a person of saying, hey, nobody's going to look after your baby as much as you are. Right? So if you're yep. a parent, you know what I'm talking about. But essentially, when it comes to personal finance, no one's going to look after you 
and like say, hey, I truly have your best best interest as much as you are. So taking the time to say, hey, let me figure some of these things out, I would very much encourage a lot of people to do. Now, if you may be on a time constraint, I understand that because people are working, you know, people are saying, hey, I got to live, I got to pay my bills, I don't have time to be looking at this stuff all day, noted, right? But even in your spare time, you know, I always encourage people, hey, you know, if you're on Instagram or social media or Twitter all day, hey, spend some of that time kind of whether it's uh, doing some deep dives into different projects or looking at charts or, you know, whatever it may be, just try to add a little bit more to your toolbox out throughout the, the weeks and the months. And you'll be so surprised at how much more confidence that you'll have. And then you're, you know, I mean, like I said, you can use someone as a like a second check to what you're believing and what you're seeing, but solely only relying on one other person to make your uh, financial decisions <laughs> for you. I would say that's high risk. All right. Yeah. Well, it's not only high risk. I think it's yeah. irresponsible to be honest. Yeah. And so I would say uh, for a lot of people who don't know how to maybe, you know, do some of these things. Okay. Well, that's where you go and learn. And so you utilize, uh, you know, channels like this. And, but then again, you know, getting some one-on-one -on -one help is always helpful. So, you know, I've done that in a lot of things in my past, whether it's like getting one-on-one -on -one help on how to run a, a route specifically, uh, how to run a play specifically, getting that one-on-one -on -one help from people that have been doing it successful, successfully, and they could show you the results and they can like clearly explain them to you. That's always helpful. And so um, leaning on people yeah. who have that knowledge is very important. And how do you get like, um, you know, just kind of looking through your own journey, right? So like, mm -hmm. who did you uh, kind of rely on and who did you get information from? And then how did you get that um, to the point to where you're basically you're like kind of off crutches and you're on, um, your own. Right. Cause I think that's how I kind of look at when I yeah. view anybody else's analysis, you know, at the beginning of kind of trying to learn a lot of this stuff is, is it is like crutches or training wheels. And then yeah. eventually you have to start, you know, walking on your own. Yeah. So, uh, believe it or not, like, you know, I, I play with a lot of incredible athletes. Um, but I would say one of the more incredible minds within the NFL space is Aaron Rodgers, obviously. Yeah. And so being in meeting rooms and having like personal conversations with him, you start to learn how to see things in a particular aspect. And I say, okay, I see how you're seeing it. It makes a little bit more sense. That actually helps me with my play. And then so you can have that synergy because uh, the way that he goes about the game is obviously from a very athletic standpoint, but a, a very calculated standpoint. And so when you can get in that mind frame of understand how to have your calculations a little bit more detailed, you generally genu uh, generate better outcomes. And so uh, learning from people like that, especially, you know, a lot of these head coaches or like specifically uh, position coaches that have been around for a long time. So Nathaniel Hackett, he's been around for a long time. I learned a lot from him and just seeing how to execute things at a high level. And you can kind of shape your mindset for success in that way. And um, no, so it's, it's been a it's been a journey. But yeah, I've never been bashful saying, hey, I have a specific question. I don't really understand this yet. But can you help me understand this from your perspective? And typically when I get that perspective from someone who's had success in the area, oh, man, I've taken our run with it and I've always been able to have success with it. So here within crypto, uh, kind of correlating that with with sports. If you guys are doing that, the more you do it, I think you guys really be successful, especially if you have a longer time horizon, like how we were talking about. Right, right. And so then in terms of the financial side, um, like, where did you go? What resources did you use to basically start uh, building out this toolbox, both on the equities, real estate side, as well as the crypto? Yeah, side? the good, the good old YouTube, right? And the good old Google. <laughs> exactly. Like, the University of YouTube, YouTube, right? Yeah, YouTube University for a reason. So like, nope. to be honest, like, this is not stuff that they teach in college and school. Like yep. I minored in business finance, and I didn't learn like 95% of this stuff. And so for me, it's just like I've always been a very curious person and wonder, wondering how things work. And what I learned to find is typically uh, YouTube and just kind of getting in touch with people within your area. Right. So, you know, for real estate uh, in the markets that I've kind of played in, you know, within the area, there's people that were doing it at a higher rate of success. And so I was like, hey, whatever I got to do to get around those people and understand, see what they're seeing, that's what I want to do. So a lot of times you got to dedicate the time to do so. And I, and I did that right when I did have the time, because remember, at that time, I was still like fully in my football career. And right. so a lot of my time was to that. But um, especially learning about equities, uh, YouTube and just getting so I like for a little bit, I did have a financial for my equities. But same thing there. He was a guy who was willing to teach me about it, not just say, hey, just buy this, do this. I'll manage it for you. 
And so mm. that's one thing that I, I really appreciated about the guy that I did have for quite a bit of time. And so I said, okay, I feel confident to be able to take this on my own. And right. So yeah, it's just about using your network of people to, um, you know, kind of ascend uh, for yourself. And then once you kind of ascend, you can help other people kind of follow up behind you, you know? Right. And which is very important as well. And that's one thing I think people take for granted or don't utilize enough is networking. I think, um, yeah. you know, social networking, uh, in terms of, you know, using social media, is well and good and that's great but also yeah. you know meeting people in your current you know in your area um is extremely important and you know um yeah but i think like you said youtube has so much information that you can't get anywhere yeah. else i would say you know crypto mindset course has a bit of a better crypto course than mit but hey I'm yeah nothing better like, <laughs> i'm just i'm just put it out there crypto mindset course is the best course in regards to crypto uh, that i've ever seen and i've kind of like kind of poked around and looked at different uh things and i mean there's nothing touching it right so yeah you guys yeah, have got yeah. a good thing going yeah no and it's good to see you know like you taking that and just like running with it so going back to the analysis here um so yeah, yeah, yeah. let's just kind of continue on and see you know um where you think the s p might be going based on where we where we are now and then how that might correlate to Bitcoin as well, because I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got like uh, one more uh, chart to show you here. So this is the NASDAQ 100 stocks above their 200 day moving average. And so kind of as we're looking at this, uh, there's two levels here. So we have 85. So basically you represent the 85 percentile. And this is when the market is doing good. So the S&P, the Na or I'm sorry, the NASDAQ, when majority of the stocks in NASDAQ 100, so basically 85 percent or higher are above the 200 day moving average, we'll see that it stays up here for quite a bit of time. And what do we see? That means price is ripping to the upside. And then so especially like kind of here, this chunk and price is just ripping to the upside this entire time. But periodically we'll have this volatility to the downside. And then basically meaning a good portion of those stocks are below their 200 day moving average. And so indicating here in this red line, when about 15% of those stocks are below their 200 uh, day moving average, uh, you know, or, or I'll say, you know, when majority of them are below their moving average, so not above, right. Okay. We'll see these, uh, these dips, right. And so these vertical lines here in green, these have stayed the same through all the metrics that we've looked at. And what we see is that correlation. So we'll see like these moments in time where there's just quite a few of those stocks below their 200 day moving average. And so we'll see these wicks here, here. And so we've recently seen here. And if you kind of look at, so this is a chart here in yellow for the uh, the NASDAQ actually. And same thing, you know, it's able to get a good relative low for that time period. And so we kind of just recently seen that here in like mid May and we're kind of trending back up. So more of these stocks are getting closer or above their 200 day moving average. So when majority of them, are above their 200 day moving average that's when i'll kind of say okay you know things are looking to sustain themselves but until then you know we're still kind of you know in that land of you know okay we're still kind of gauging things but nonetheless as you can kind of see we've already had a nice rebound off of this local low and we'll see right because if this metric kind of turns around and we kind of touch back here again then probably price will follow and so yeah, this is like another thing that we can kind of use to evaluate it. But basically, you know, we put all that together. So since we know that these lows are very much corresponded with the, the S&P and the NASDAQ and just the overall stock market, we can kind of hop back over uh, to just Bitcoin before, and see. Just before oh, you, you to, do that, yeah. I had one quick question on this one. So sure. it looks like uh, I, can't, I think it's both in 2016, maybe August of 2016. Um, there it has like kind of a double dip below that red line, kind of as you're yeah, saying, as a yeah, potential yeah, yeah. possibility. Um, yeah. What were the dates? And then um, in terms of the low to low, what was the time period? Uh, how long was, how many weeks were between there? Um, gotcha. So the first little spike below, so let's kind of zoom in here so we can kind of get a little bit more detail. So if we're kind of looking at this time, and so you're talking about this portion here, correct? Right. Okay. So this first time was like January, late January of 2016. And as you can see, there was that low and then there was a nice rebound. And so like from a percentage aspect back then, that was you know pretty significant. And then you kind of came back down one more time. And so we've seen this metric kind of have a wick down, 
these candles go up and then as the kind of weeks go along we have a little bit more volatility therefore bringing a lot of these uh, stocks below the 200 day moving average and we've seen like a like a double dip but this one looks to be like a little bit lower so that you know that very much may be on the table for uh bitcoin and also the traditional markets as well and we'll see as it plays out but kind of like i said when we start getting back up in, in the bulk of things so how you know kind of we're sustaining something right is when we have these uh these candles kind of trending more towards this higher part of the metric here at this 85 level and right. so yeah the other thing I, so that that's perfect and then the other thing i was looking at there as well was between those so that was like uh there's a couple of weeks between those minor dips what about uh the previous higher low dip that went below the red line uh, i think that one was august and then the so the second one was august one was february so it was about maybe like what six or eight months apart yeah 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 so this is yeah give or take about like you know eight months give or take between both of them and so you know this one it didn't go as far down right but nonetheless this is still a, a big deviation from the bulk here and so you know this was a considerable dip at the time and then there's a nice rebound and then kind of like a, a double dip you know uh yeah give or take about eight or nine months so uh so then, you know th these things are reflexive so we're gonna kind of see uh what happens but the biggest key is understanding of like okay well why are we in these markets just in general because what happens majority of the time so these are just blips on the radar if you really think about it even back here in 2011 oh, yeah. you know where you know we've seen a considerable or like a little bit longer of a dip so you know if we want to look at the the date range and kind of get an idea uh you know how long uh this yeah, stuff can stay the, down there the one just above the ruler at the bottom right uh, uh yeah yeah here we go right, yeah so oh no sorry, uh no, right. no no here right there you go so if we look at the the date range and we say okay well how long can things kind of retrace and kind of stay stagnant and down for a bit of time you know we're looking at you know quite some time and if you want to consider this so we're looking at give or take you know 100 days and so mm -hmm. that's you know several months of kind of at that lower portion so you know you have the initial dip but then you spend some time you rebound but then you kind of dip back down again even and so you know that's something to kind of look at but okay 100 days you know that's a, a little bit less than a third of a year but what happens is from there you have sustained uptrend and so these are just kind of blips on the radar and majority of the time you are you know in profit especially if you're taking advantage of these pivot points and these dips and so that's why i think it's very easily uh kind of missed as far as saying hey you know with my strategy of how i'm allocating my funds you know especially like you know in between these moments here you're kind of like okay well yeah let me just allocate and yeah you can dca on an uptrend but you just kind of kind of look at risk right because you know the higher the prices go um without a dip right you know the more risky you kind of put yourself at but when you have a considerable dip and you have these measures can kind of a uh, basically get a, a qualitative view of it then you can kind of see okay well cool like this is a quality dip to take advantage of and especially when you kind of get a a couple in a row you know you just have a sustained uptrend so this is a portion of you know like we said eight or nine months but then you have years of uptrend and exactly. so typically when the stock market is ripping bitcoin and crypto is ripping even harder and then that's what we're in this market for we're in the in it for those exponential gains right so yeah exactly and showing those examples there i think gives people a better mindset or perspective on kind of where we are where we're going because like you said before um your time frame or time horizon is massively important because if, if it does go continue to go down which um i think is more likely than not at least uh, in the current moment um and if, it, if we get that, let's say through a bearish summer, right? That's what I think people usually get wrong when um, they're focused on a market. They're too short term, right? Yeah. They're focused yeah, on sure. just one, two, three, four, six months. They can't be patient um, for six to eight months because they probably are investing more than they're willing to lose um, or maybe don't have enough to invest as well. So I think it's, you know, showing that perspective there like you are um, is massively important. And like you said before, I think, um, for you yourself specifically, you're looking at this as like, you know, a five year decade type plan, right? You're not looking at this yeah. as like, I'm in here for one year to get rich quick and I'm out. <laughs> I mean, just, just, just think about it guys. Like, you know, especially if you look at some of the best investors through time, you know, Warren Buffett, 
what are one of the main things that he talks about? He he likes getting, or he's talking about companies in reference, but we'll talk about crypto. But he likes getting great assets at low valuations and holding them basically forever, but for a long time. And yep. so, you know, kind of how I see exponential growth when it comes to your financials, like, hey, you know, because the thing is, hey, some people started off with more money than others, but it's really about that time that helps you get that exponential factor to the amount of money that you put in. And so, you know, it doesn't matter how much you're putting in. It's just a matter of like, how are you going to be able to utilize your money in a correct way? So like one thing that I've like kind of started to see is, yeah, we all need to go work hard and work for money. But then once we attain that capital, make that capital your employee. Right. So mm. get that money to work for you. And so in these markets, we can do that. That way, when you sleep, you know, you're going to be able to have some type of growth. And through time, that's how you get the exponential growth. So if we kind of like yep. do like this example, yeah, you may start off kind of here, but then through time, as the years go on, you kind of see that get exponentially higher and higher and higher. And then after a while, it's just kind of like whoop, to the upside. Right. And so, you know, that's just you know, in, profit in three years. <laughs> yeah. And then along the way, you know, you know, go ahead and, and, you know, take your profits, you know, and yeah, but you know, there's a whole strategy to doing that, which you guys go over in the course. And so, um, yeah, you know, that's all about how to generate wealth, but then maintain it. And, you know, then from there, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say you're going to be invincible. You're just going to have a lot more options within your lifestyle. Right. Right. And kind of like with your long-term plans, cause we've talked about this personally, you don't have to, you know, uh, say as much detail, but generally speaking, um, with inflation, the way it is this decade, you know, with somebody who has, you know, anywhere between like 50,000 to $500,000, um, or maybe even somebody who has like one or 2 million. Sure. At what level do you think they have like some level of self sovereignty to where they'll be able to take care of themselves for the rest of hmm. uh, themselves and a family for the rest of their lives? Because I think a lot of people are after that generational wealth, um, for themselves, for their families, um, for, you know, living uh -huh. the life that they want to live what number do you think you know by the end of the decade or the middle of this decade is important to kind of shoot for because i think yeah, yeah. you know a lot of people used to be like okay if i only had a million dollars right that, was, like, that <laughs> yeah. was the goal but it doesn't seem yeah. quite like that anymore yeah so obviously due to inflation a million dollars today is not worth what it was 10 years ago yep. that's a good question um i'd say if you have it in just cash that's a different story. I would encourage people to not hold majority of their wealth in just solely cash. Like you need to have cash to, you know, maintain yourself, obviously, for all your expenses. But typically, you know, if you look at specifically higher worth net uh, net worth individuals, majority of their net worth is in assets that produce cash, right? Mm. And so obviously, you know, with the, the DeFi space kind of coming along in doing some revolutionary things and having those opportunities to be able to maintain the asset and get some type of yield on it is very, you know, interesting. So even with the stablecoin USDC or whatever it may be, but I'd say, you know, I'd, I'd put it like this, if you could, I'd say within the next decade, so, or let's just say till 2030, if you could get to the, maybe like that, that four to $5 million net worth range. So not all in cash, right? Mm. Right. I would venture to say real you estate. could probably, yeah. So, you know, whether it's in, you know, in, in, in crypto per se, and you know, that may, may fluctuate, but whether it's real estate or, you know, even if you want to dip into stocks, I would say eh, it's not as premier of an asset compared to crypto as, you know, as we all know, um, you know, that's obviously my bias and, you know, our bias here with the moon game. So, oh, yeah. um, and, and that's proven to be true, right? You know, there's nothing, nothing touching crypto from a, like an accumulation to, you know, a high uh, profit taking uh, potential, right? And stuff like that. But um, yeah, I would say, yeah, that four to $5 million range is something that you could kind of get to and be able to maintain that really for a lifetime. But like I said, you got to have some type of strategy to it because you can get to that. I've seen a lot of guys, you know, in a year make two, three, four, $5 million. And I've seen them spend it like crazy too. So <laughs> right. that's a relative question because it really depends on how you want to live your life because yeah, you can make a lot of money, but if you spend a lot of money, then it really doesn't matter. And so right. um, yeah, it's up to each person individually, but I'll venture to say most, most people have a threshold of saying, Hey, you know, I, I have a lifestyle, you know, you, whether you got your own finance and you got your kids and you, your expenses, your home or whatever the case may be, 
uh, you know, that amount of money, you have an opportunity, right? to steward it in the right way to where you can maintain it for a long time and be able to basically pay for almost everything that you can ever think of. Right. Right. Exactly. And I think there's some people who, you know, um, that sounds like a lot of money. Right. But really, I mean, I think it's like we have the most exponential growing industry right in front of us. Yeah. Like take advantage, you know, like, yeah, take advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot for five, 10, hundred, I think, you know, may have been a number <laughs> that we were looking at. So yeah, um, that's, you know, the Citadel level right there. <laughs> hell yeah. Hell yeah. So um, yeah. let's get back into the analysis. So um, are you basically then have the analysis here for the S&P and the NASDAQ that you're looking at and then want to shift over to Bitcoin or what do you think? Yeah. So basically, um, no. So like these particular dates, right? So we've seen like they've been relative local lows. So, uh, you know, we're looking at May of 2022. We'll see through time if this actually ends up being true. But every portion here beforehand has been pretty pretty accurate so you know we're going on probability we can't predict things for sure but you know through time we're looking at all these different pivot points so we're and how looking did, at like august of 15. Oh, go ahead right i was gonna say how did this look because a lot of people are looking towards a recession right so mm -hmm. in other financial crisis situations like 2008 obviously we saw 2020 but that was rather quick so like in 2008 or in let's say you know the year 2000 with you know the tech stock crash like uh -huh. how did this metric look yeah and then so obviously you know so there was basically <laughs> like one, like basically everything was under its 100 day move or 200 day moving average right during this time especially at its worst case and what what I will say in re in regards to like the whole recession talk i generally think that the fed has different tools that they are utilizing basically helicopter money to <laughs> right. kind of prevent severities this drastic. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I, I think what we've seen with COVID, that was something that you know nobody was anticipating and we kind of haven't seen in recent uh, time, especially like recent decades, right? And so they stepped in and they just started printing. And I would venture to say if things get very crazy, I'm like I said, I don't think that you know this scenario would be my primary uh, outlook. Not ruling it out, but like my primary outlook is saying, hey, the, the Fed will step in and start printing some money, start saying, hey, you know, we're going to aid the, the economy. We're not going to tighten so much. We're going to basically start easing. So quantitative easing, putting money into the markets and then basically they give it to banks. Banks start loaning it out. You know, people start attaining more money. And then, you know, how these markets work, uh, people take loans against their assets to basically buy more assets. And then so they put it into the stock market and also crypto markets as well. When right. that happens, price goes up. So, well, yeah. And I mean, uh, I think a lot of people don't um, realize the power of retail, um, kind of going what you're saying there, where mm. people are like, okay, they're just, they want, you know, the returns. So, we were talking about this article yesterday with the EU. They're the actual rate, the regulators are afraid that retail um, will essentially just be like losing so much money through inflation that they just want to jump into crypto because they need something higher risk they need to you know kind of risk it for that biscuit otherwise they you know are just going to be continuously losing money so i think people don't take uh the power of retail into account because a lot of the times when you have movements on the chart right you can get a whale coming in to create a floor or to create a top but yeah. if they're trying to move price you know if it's just the whale they'll buy the price will shoot and then the price will dump like yeah you know, for people sure. are just going to sell into that so uh, you need retail, you need those kind of people at the sides, the edges of the chart, basically moving up the price. And yeah, so, yeah. like you said, if, you know, the Fed doesn't, um, you know, continue quantitative tightening, they basically go back to easing because they're afraid, essentially, like if they bring this market in terms of the traditional market too far down, people are just going to go straight to crypto anyways. Which, yeah, no, you know, something that they don't necessarily want. Yeah, like like you said, the biggest thing is so like, you know, people that allocate large uh, chunks of capital, especially in the crypto, they do it very, I would say, you know, methodically. So they just don't put right. all their capital at once because they'll wick up the price. Yep. And yeah, so they'll basically get debased because people will sell off that pump. But uh, they can create a floor, like you said. And once they're into the market and they start to realize this market, like they cre they can create the floor. But the only thing that can get price to continue to drive up is demand. And that right. demand is followed through, through with retail, you know? Yeah. So yep. through, through demand is how you get price appreciation. 
And so retail is that big driver of like how you see, okay, well, things get started and then things just kind of like take off. And then so like if I, you know, kind of reference back to like the Bitcoin chart here, um, you know, what, what we see is, yeah, like, you know, when these bottoms are kind of in, yeah, you know, there's a lot of institutional and hedge funds and sovereign wealth funds that kind of start doing what they're going to do. But then like these explosive, like especially like these blow off tops, these are all due to retail and people rushing to the asset class, trying to get a little taste of that exponential gain. But like, yep. you know, us here in the moon game, we're up to the, we're, we're hip to understand the ebbs and flow. So, you know, we're allocating in the lower portion of these RSI and, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, basically, you know, that's the gist of understanding the market um, and understanding that retail is very important as of right now, our assessment of what we can see is this retails, you know, they're, they're not as, you know, I guess you can say invested in paying attention to the market as they were um, compared to when prices are higher, you know? Yeah, when you had uh, Shiba Inu, Dogecoin, GMO, yeah, or sorry, all what was it, GameStock? Yeah, it's just like yeah. you know. <laughs> Sometimes I question the uh, the the sanity of retail, but hey. Um, so yeah, what do you think? So I, I keep I'm basically just coming back to the same question the whole time because I want your analysis on this too. Yeah. Um, so now with, that we have that going, where do you see Bitcoin going along with uh, the traditional markets here? In yeah, the yeah. Let's say a few so, months because yeah. you mentioned those things about the Fed, which I think you know we have the uh, the next interest rate hike uh, being announced potentially in the middle of this month. Yeah, so mid June, I think it's what like the the fifteenth and the sixteenth, something like that. Yep. Uh, the Fed they'll be talking about what they're going to do as far as interest rate. So what we've seen is uh, fifty basis points, so half a percent the past couple of months, and they've been talking very hawkish of kind of like continuing that trend. And so, you know, typically that puts a little, little bit of fear into the market. And so we're going to see, you know, how the markets react. We'll see if it's priced in um, as we can kind of see. So like, you know, the stock market is kind of heading down as of, you know, as of today, right? Kind of heading back down. And so kind of what I'm also seeing, if we kind of, you know, want to put this chart on like a daily time frame, for example, And so some of the levels that I'm looking at specifically and, and same thing, like you can see that correlation, right? So if you kind of like overlay that oh, correlation yeah. has been you know, pretty dang spot on, especially since the beginning of the year. Right. And then so now together. this bottom <laughs> and had a, a nice impulse up. Now, Bitcoin didn't necessarily follow right away, mm -hmm. but it is following a little bit, but especially on this downtrend, you know, kind of following with the, the S and P. So, Yep. Uh, really, you know, like some of the pivot points that I'm kind of looking at really, um, you know, is this is here. So my, my thing is this. Right. We have these level of support right where we, we break them and then we form a new level of support. Now, this level we're at, especially like compared to back here in the summer of last year, we've kind of wicked down to it. And then even like early on right here in early 2021, we kind of used it as somewhat of a support as well. So. This, this past month, we've just kind of been in this little channel here, and that's been interesting. And so really, it's just kind of saying, okay, are we going to break that major support level? And with some of the things going on in the macro environment uh, and the lackluster performance as far as like retail's interest in, in crypto right now, uh, you know, I, I really think that, you know, we're going to have to see. And so, you know, with your analysis with the 60-day cycles, uh, we're going to see like, especially like on the back end. So if we like do a, a date range and kind of look at, you know, from this low and we go give or take about 30 days, uh, we look at from like a 60 day cycle perspective. Typically what we've been seeing are some like left translated cycles. And if we get another left translated cycle and that kind of lines up with, uh, you know, like that announcement of kind of what they're going to do with interest rates. So because right. you know, this is putting us on June 11th. So, you know, four or five days after. So that put us on day maybe like 35. If we kind of start to get that high in there and they kind of give us some news that, you know, things are going to continue to, you know, go up in interest rates at a substantial rate at 50 basis points or, you know, hope to God they don't go to 75 basis points. That would be <laughs> crazy. Yeah. But what, what I, I think do, there was speculation about that the last time around and yeah, it was didn't happen, yeah. right? But what I do, but what I did notice is the, the inflation uh, count has been kind of going down. So 
I want to say for, you know, previous months, like we had like 8.9, which is kind of like the peak. And then the last inflation reading was at 8.4. So we are seeing inflation go down now, I think because that's their main goal. So if they can get inflation to go down, let's say we started jumping into like the, the seven, the six and the five percentile range. Then, you know, they may say, hey, we don't need to tighten so much. Therefore, we don't need to bump these interest rates so much. And then so really, I'm kind of looking at after summer, you know, really towards like that September time saying there's maybe a good chance that they're going to stop that quantitative tightening and then switch back over to quantitative easing, inject some, you know, some capital back into the market and get that engine yep. back rolling for the economy, you know, so. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, we could do some fundamental speculation as well as terms of what would that be that is going to be the excuse for them to do that. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the elections are coming up um, and in November. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a lot of, you know, basically war drum beating. So, yeah, uh, things are getting interesting. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. And then, so it's like you just do a Fibonacci retracement, you know, from that low to like, you know, we'll, we'll see if this is the high for the six day cycle. Uh, you know, we may have a little. Yeah. You, you know, we'll see. Right. But same thing here. We'll see if we start to descend down and then mainly like this point five level, if we start to break this. Right. Then I'd say, yeah, like typically, you know, we'll have a little bit more downside to the, the last portion of the six day cycle, which kind of brings us into like late uh, June, early July. And then so we'll go from there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um if you were to have, if you were to choose a number for Bitcoin, you know, as a low for this year, um, I know that's, you know, a hard question, um, but uh, what would be the number that you're looking for? Like you put in those Hail Mary buy orders. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, kind of what I have here. So like a, a, a low and like I said, no one can predict the future. But if you're kind of looking at sentiment, if you're looking at some of the macro factors, especially what's going on globally, I would say like that lower 22 range, 23K is something that potentially like we could see. So if you have some Hail Mary buy orders, they would be in this range, right? In, in between like 22 and like 24K. And because hmm. if you kind of just look at like structure, right? Like we still haven't broken like this. I guess you can say this, this downtrend, like for us to say, hey, you know, things are getting turned around. Like we don't want to kind of see things kind of break above, you know, this, this level here, this trend line. And so, but if we kind of want to look at more structure, uh, just like in, in recent time, you know, especially if I kind of, we're looking at lows, we're kind of in like a little diagonal pattern to the yes. downside still. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what happens with that through time. And cause you know, we'll, we'll see these touch points. And so we've got some, you know, pretty good touch points here. Let me clean that up. And let's uh, change this color here. But we got some touch points that are kind of still showing us that uh, the momentum is still to the downside. And so through time, we'll, we'll kind of see. Let me just align that. And, you know, there's like a clear picture of us kind of ranging. We got a touch point here, straddling above here. And then we had like that whole Luna situation that kind of spooked a lot of people. Right. But also just, you know, macro markets going down as well. And then that kind of yeah, really perpetuated kind of like this wick here. Yeah, it's not not the best combo. Yeah. And then so this is still kind of leading. So basically what I'm kind of looking for is through time right now, if we end up having a right translated cycle and things looking you know pretty good, hopefully we can break this uh, this trend line here. And that would happen maybe around like that 34, 35 K range. And there we would need to go ahead and break that like that 37 K range really to start to say, OK, cool. We're in the right translated cycle. Things are kind of looking pretty decent. But if we just get knocked back down off of this trend line, and you know things are developing in the the macro sense of still being pretty bearish and you know, a lot of geopolitical stuff going on leading into like the elections in november and especially like this this summer uh really kind of being a little you know i, I really don't like using terms of like uh you know uh, we're in a bear market or like bearish yeah. or, or bullish it's just like looking at the data and say okay which like which way is the price trending right and well, so and the bull yeah. the bull or bear trend depends on your time horizon right if exactly, you're exactly. a person who's willing to you know look at markets in two three five year cycles exactly. you're gonna you're not really gonna mind so much but if you're a person who's looking like you know only two months three months four months like you know you're you're not really paying attention to you know the macro trend 
Yeah, the, the way that I see it, if I know I'm in an asset class that I know I want to be in for an extended period of time, any downtrend in price, I'm looking at as a incredible buying opportunity. That's how I frame it in mind. Exactly. And so, you know, you know, if we're kind of looking at like this daily chart here, we'll kind of see if we kind of straddle on top of this uh, support line. And if we either like kind of bounce off of this trend line and then so I can maybe see something kind of uh, going in in the way of let's see here. Let me see if I can get my my little tool here to draw some stuff. What are you looking for? Uh, so I'll be, I'm going to do this. So like if we can kind of and visualize, you know, maybe some action like this potentially, and we'll see where that leads us. You know, that right. is, you know, a somewhat of a scenario that we could see. And that's kind of maybe like the, the, the bearish case, but vice versa on, on the bullish case, if we kind of get a situation where we're going to go ahead and break this trend line so we have a, a right translated cycle let's say the fed announces that you know inflation is dropping considerably and they're kind of putting a little bit more dovish language out there basically saying hey we're, we may ease up a little bit on the tightening we could kind of see this kind of come back down but then we break it and then we start you know you know getting some positive price action to the upside so yeah no, that's that would a lot of now. Yeah, that would show a lot of strength in Bitcoin if it were to do that, just because, you know, usually if you test support that many times, it's usually going to break, right? Yeah, um, so, you know, bounce one, two, three, then you kind of, you know, go the opposite direction, so. Right, exactly. And so, yeah, I think it's um, likely, my, personally, you know, that uh, they, you know, talk about another interest rate hike, interest rate hike here, um, you know, this month. And so we have more downside going into July. But after that, I would say not that the worst is potentially over, um, yeah, yeah. but for the most part, it is. And I do think there is limited downside on Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of reasons, as we've uh, talked about before, as to why that is. But, um, you know, people won't believe it until they see it, right? Yeah, I think the main thing is if you call yourself a long term investor, well, I would encourage people to you know, look at different markets in that way. But especially this crypto market as being a long term investor. The biggest thing you need to know and realize up and to the right. Yeah, exactly, right? Up and to the right. There's and so that's how you one get of my the favorite. Experience. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite memes is like uh this guy is like, so Bitcoin went from a dollar to a thousand dollars and then it crashed <laughs> down to a hundred. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. you know, people really need to focus on that long term goal. Um exactly. But yeah, exactly. I get I get what you're saying there. So um cool. Anything else that you were thinking about with either price action or whatever? Uh, as of right now, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, like I said, I, I think we have a lot of great things coming down the pike just from the aspect of how this industry is getting built out and the adoption it's happening, guys. Like I know we're at a very, I guess you can say lackluster point in the cycle. But, you know, as we all know, when that adoption comes, it comes quick and it comes fast. And so we want to be prepared. And so that's exactly what we're doing by, you know, spending the time know coming here evaluating different things from different uh you know viewpoints but then at the same time go ahead and get some good dca in while the pricing is relatively low so right exactly so i think that's you know really good analysis really good way to look at the market here today so um where can people follow you if they want a little bit more information uh i'd say you know you guys look basically what i'm doing here on youtube I'm going ahead and getting my, my YouTube journey started. So you guys can find me at Swerve the Dip on YouTube, but then also on Twitter as well, under Swerve the Dip. And yeah, man, hit, hit me up. I'm always willing to talk crypto, always willing to talk ball, whatever you guys are you know, into uh, as far as those two things. I, you know, I definitely can have some good conversations around that. So Awesome. So I'll throw these in the chat for you guys. So at Tyler Irvin underscore here on Twitter, or you can just type in Swerve dot the dip. Um, really easy to find on YouTube as well, um, which I like. Uh, I am subscribed as well. So um, go over here. We have seven subscribers for Tyler here on YouTube. Let's uh, pump it up. He has, you know, I love that you got the Pepe memes going on in your thumbnails as well. So perfect. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, then here on Twitter as well, you know, uh, you got one of your, your charts here pinned. So um, he's basically going to be uh, continuing to be more active here. Um, and then also, yeah, if you want a consultation with Tyler, he is now part of the Cultivate Crypto 
team uh, in terms of jumping on the one-on-one -on -one lessons. So um, we got Greg, we got Tyler. Um, and if you guys want consultations with them, uh, jump over here, uh, cultivatecrypto.com slash shop. Press the one-on-one -on -one single lesson. Take some time to load. And uh, yeah, I have Greg's background here. I'll throw yours up there as well. Haven't put that out there quite yet. Um, but yeah, be sure to jump over there and uh, get on it because uh, Tyler has a lot of really good information out there. So be sure to uh, follow him, hit him up on Telegram in the course, hit him up for a consultation, uh, lots of different stuff there. So appreciate you coming on here today. Um, good stuff. Okay, I appreciate it. Looking forward to the next one. All right. Awesome, man. Uh, so we'll be back here on uh, Friday tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, as per usual, for our casual Friday. So until then, guys, peace, live long and prosper. We'll catch you all again soon. Later.